Let's address the elephant in the room. Dear elephant, you are correct. Because I am the starter set guy, I am going to cover Fandelver and below the Shattered Obelisk. I'm also going to give away a bunch of copies of the book. But I get the feeling that when some people read these big, stupid, complicated books, they don't really know how to translate that into fun at the table, and that makes them feel stupid. And then I release this video saying, this is how to make it fun. They go, oh, Matt gets it. I don't get it. I read these books, and the first time I read them, the first time I run them, I get it completely wrong. The notes I'm laying on are about the first session of the adventure, when the players discover that everybody in Fandolin has gone missing and they have to work out why. This session is a mystery. I deliberately chose to run it as a mystery because I've never really done that particularly successfully before. But I contacted the Alexandrian because they have a new book called So You Want to Be a Game Master. This isn't sponsored, by the way. I just really... I'm a fan. Um, so I followed the advice in their chapter on mysteries, and this process is the result. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk you through this matrix of clues and scenes and revelations, and then we're going to debrief with Justin Alexander himself so that he can kind of uh, point me in the right direction. Don't take this as advice for the session. Please only take it as advice for your process. Fair warning that in this video, I will be played by this mic stand, this rattly, rattly mic stand. So the advice in this book for your mystery, it suggested you start with revelations. I picked four revelations for this session. The first was all the townspeople have been kidnapped. It's not some of the townspeople. It's not some of them have been killed and some of them have been kidnapped. No, it's all of them have been kidnapped. That's Revelation 1. Revelation 2 is the perpetrators escaped via a well. The Revelation 3 is that the goal of these, these kidnappers was to grab these black rocks scattered around town. And last revelation is the kidnappers are psionic goblins. So each of these revelations have to be built up via clues and leads over a number of scenes. A scene is distinct from a location, like this first scene is just a hook that could happen anywhere. This second scene is a location that's Bart's tap house, which is on fire. The third scene was at the Shrine of Luck, which has been collapsed because they stole an integral rock from it. The fourth scene was at the Sleeping Giant, which is flooded with magical beer and an owlbear lurking around. The fifth scene is at the well. And this last scene has nothing written on it. This is a wandering scene. This was something that I expected could be proactive and happen to the players at any time. Each of these scenes are meant to have a few elements. So they have an agenda, which is the why the players are there, what they are doing, what is their goal in this location. Then it's the environment, which is the physical description. Then there's characters, which can be lead characters, supporting characters, or extras, which are pretty much backdrop. And then you need the bang, which is the inciting incident that incites the players towards action. So for example, Bart's tap house is on fire and they need to get in there and rescue Buddy. There's a bunch of clues along the way. Now I will say I only allowed two hours for prep. So some of these cards have nothing on it. So all the clues I have here on the town's people being kidnapped revelation, these are all evidence. These are all evidence of this fact. And I've associated each of them, if you can just draw your lines here, uh, with these separate scenes. The, the cover to the well is not smashed open, it's unlocked. Isn't that a bit weird? That's not violent. Or they find Sister G at the Shrine of Luck. Why didn't they take her? Why is she still here? That's a bit, that's a bit weird. In this instance, the reason they didn't take Sister G is because in my game, she's been possessed by Agatha. She doesn't count as a townsperson. She counts as a threat. Or in Bart's burnt down tavern, they find that the source of the fire was an arson, it was unattended spaghetti cooking. And then right there in the hook, we see evidence of this in that there is a stall which is unattended. Now I also put this one up here on the actual revolution revelation, because this is something that I can move around. I can move this to wherever is appropriate. And it says there's signs of a struggle. I mean, eh, eh. 
There's signs of a struggle, but no blood. Isn't that interesting? For the evidence that the goblins escaped via the well, I have this roaming clue that I can put anywhere, which is goblin footprints that are muddy. There's mud tracked everywhere, and it stinks, because down in that well, there's a, there's a garbage monster. Or how about this for the tap house with the owlbear? The goblins entered via the roof, and they used this soggy, rotten rope to do so. This is rope that they nicked from the well. And then when they're finally down in the well to determine that the goblins did pass through here, um, there's something that super duper stinks throughout the whole area and it matches that smell. This clue here with the rope has a little arrow on it and it's saying pointing to five because this is an evidence, right? This is evidence, this is evidence, but this one is also a lead. It's a lead because it leads from this scene with the owlbear to the next logical conclusion, which is at the well. The rope came from the well. Let's go look at the well. And this is the point of the campaign, right? It's called the Shattered Obelisk. The goblins are collecting pieces of this Shattered Obelisk. So what's frustrating about this is that a lot of these clues are the same. You go to a location and there's a black rock that is missing. And maybe there's a way to do this that doesn't duplicate the same kind of feeling, like the counterweight at the well, that's a black rock, and it's missing. Or how about the central stone at the Shrine of Luck, that's a black rock, and it's missing. Oh no, the black tap handle at the tap house, that's a black rock, and it's missing. So those three are pretty much identical, which is frustrating. But this one is saying there is a station set up at the tap house where some kind of uh, leader or organizer goblin was confirming whether these are the right stones. And they have a bunch of stones collected and sorted um, by <laughs> blackness and shade. Or this one at Bart's place that has caught on fire, some silly goblin heard the brief of collect black rocks and they collected a bunch of charcoal. And this charcoal they found at various other locations as well. For the conclusion that the kidnappers are psionic goblins, I had a lot of clues. This first one is a floating clue that I could put anywhere because I am replacing the goblin leader of the Xionic Goblins with Yemik. So they find some graffiti that says, Mickey was here. And I wanted that to clearly be, hey, like, that's not great grammar. You know, maybe it's a dumb creature. Then for my hook, I have this lead that I want to point them towards scene two. They start at the hook where they see a stall unintended, unattended, and then they move to Bart's fireplace. Uh, so this is not really a clue for this, I suppose. Now that I think about it, that doesn't indicate goblins or psionic at all. In fact, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. Uh, this clue right here that was also at Bart's place is they find green blood and it has signs of a struggle and there's an empty healing potion there. The healing potion is of um, Sister Gorel's making. This is clearly a lead that points them at Sister Gorel. There's also a hint that they are psionic because Buddy, who is an asthmatic and old, frail cat, was found hiding in a place where he shouldn't be able to reach. The implication being that he was either blasted there or he was telekinesed way too high. Then, at the Shrine of Luck, Sister G, as she's trapped underneath these rocks, she says she heard someone and saw a hairy, mitted hand as she was trapped under, but they didn't try and help her. Now, this is meant to point towards a goblinoid, which would be a, um, a, a bugbear, in this case, the still living and very angry Clark, who would love to go and fight Yemek. This person was drunk. And that's meant to point at the tap house. At the tap house, they look at the damage to the roof and to the um, and to the the bar. It is concussive in nature. And then there's at the well, they pulled out all the stones and like kind of collapsed the tunnel behind them to cover their tracks. Goblins shouldn't have that kind of strength. So I highlighted highlight to the players. Look, you think it would probably take you 
a bunch of tools and probably about eight hours to collapse this tunnel by hand. Skibbity bubbity bibbity wop boop. It's time to talk to Justin Alexander. He wrote a book about how to be a gum. And he's going to teach me what I did wrong this session. I hope that he likes all the things I did. Boop boop. Before we start, plug your book. What's your book? When's it coming out? When can I get it? My book is So You Want to Be a Game Master. Um, it's been out for just over a week uh, here in the States. Uh, it is currently, at my understanding, it's currently on a ship to Australia and New Zealand on the other side there. And as soon as it arrives there, it will be on sale there as well. Um, international shipping has turned into a, a nightmare, as I think most people know these days. Um, so it, it's a 500 plus page book that serves as both an introduction to being a game master if you've never been a game master before, or even if you've never played a role playing game before. But it also then builds on those basic skills over the next 400 pages of the book. And it's really designed to be the ultimate GM survival's guide. Um, if you're ever trying to figure out, oh my goodness, what do I do now? this book will hopefully have the answer to what do you prep? How do you use that prep? Uh, how do you respond to the players doing something uh, completely crazy at the table? Yeah, I um, you sent me a PDF of it and I, I read probably about a hundred pages of it total because it is 500 pages, right? But I was like, let me, let me get a feel for this book. I would consider myself like, a medium dungeon master, you know? I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'm a bit above a beginner. Um, and I was challenged by a lot of stuff in it. So even though the title seems like, so you want to be a game master, beginner stuff, there's juice in there. I think it's hard to write a 500 page book without accidentally even stumbling into juice. <laughs> There's probably good advice in every 500 page book. If, if we put the book into a juice press, there will be something that will come out the other end of it. Can I just ask off the bat, did you see any mistakes? Like, do you see any like traps that I'd set my myself in that matrix no i didn't uh so yeah so so looking at um oh, okay everything exploded there instead of being graceful but looking at the shared obelisk uh video i didn't see any big traps i think i think the biggest thing is like what you discovered um is you got a little bit ahead of the class uh because the section of the book you were talking about uh starts with talking about how to do a linear mystery which is in scene a you have three clues and i guess we can talk a little bit about the three clue rule so the three clue rule is sort of the foundation for all mystery scenarios where for any conclusion you want the PCs to make, you need to include at least three clues. So that linear mystery that you're talking about is really the first scene has three clues or leads that are pointing to the second scene. You get to the second scene and there's three clues there. But what you quickly discovered is that linear mysteries completely work and they're a very robust structure, but it's very tempting and very easy and very natural to have a mystery that will suddenly sort of balloon out because in reality, everything is interconnected with each other. And that's going to kind of be the next section of the book where I talk about something called node-based uh, scenario design, a node-based mystery design. And that's really a structure you can use to begin navigating more complex uh, mystery scenarios. And like this is a classic example too of how these tools become very flexible as you begin combining them. So like the book talks about how to run a dungeon, then it talks about how to run mysteries, then it talks about raids and heists and urban crawls and wilderness adventures. And they're kind of siloed off a bit in the book. But one thing I do talk about towards the end is think about how you can begin mixing these different things into an adventure, into a campaign. And so like a, a really classic example of this too is like a dungeon. Like we all know how a dungeon works. You go into a dungeon, there's rooms, you move through corridors and everything else, but you can add a whole extra layer of interactivity to a dungeon by using these mystery techniques to bake clues into various rooms of the dungeon. And so as the PCs are navigating through the dungeon, they can discover these clues and, and reach these appropriate revelations as well. Yeah, I, I treated the list of revelations as like, those were my goals. Those are the, those mm -hmm. were like the crucial, that's the crucial exposition that I needed the players to have in order to make the session after where they're going into a, you know, a goblin settlement, an old Duragar um, fortress and trying to rescue these people makes sense, you know, because I often find sometimes that like, if I don't give the correct exposition uh, to my players to give them the context, sometimes I'll ask one of those dreaded questions. It's like, wait, why do we care about this guy? Wait, who is this person? I'm like, the villain. <laughs> who is the villain? <laughs> okay, I've, I've messed up. Well, and, and you touched on this great in the video, which I think is a really great sophisticated concept, which is that there are two different kinds of clues and kind of two different 
um, types of revelations that you can have or conclusions that you can have in a scenario. And one of those is the lead that points you to where you can continue your investigation. And the other one is evidence that points you towards some sort of like informational knowledge that you need. Uh, so for example, knowing that the goblins are psionic doesn't necessarily give you any information about where to go to continue your investigation or where those goblins came from, for example, but can be very important information for the players to know to understand, like you say, what the heck is going on in this scenario. <laughs> when we ran the session, I messed up one of my leads so bad, Justin. Uh, there was this one lead where I wanted the players to know that um, the goblins had also set up some kind of base in the sleeping giant tap house, which was like flooded with magical beer. Um, and the way I wanted to lead them there was Sister Gorel heard some, like a bugbear stumbling around and they were drunk. That was it. That was like the bit of evidence. I forgot to do that at the session. So they just entirely, even though I, I really wanted it to be linear, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, they skipped the tap house. And I, d I didn't know what to do with that because I'd planned a bunch of other crucial information, crucial clues at the tap house. They instead went to the town master's office. And I, and I wasn't sure whether it was correct to move those clues that I had at the tap house just into the town master's office. So like, one of the things I talk about in um, and one of the things I talk about uh, when, when you're designing mysteries or the three clue rule is a corollary to the three clue rule, which is permissive clue finding, which okay. is, you know, when you design when you design a mystery scenario to have that mystery scenario be robust, you want to have like for each conclusion, you want to have those three clues that you've planned out and said, OK, these are the ways that the PCs can find this. But in reality, if you have a completely well-realized situation, you know what's been happening and what's going on in the town, or in this in the case, in the case of the town here, or in the case of the mystery in general, then it's fully possible for the players who have who are creative and have their own agenda and will do things you never anticipate in your prep to go and do a thing which would logically result in them accomplishing the thing that they want to do. A good mm -hmm. analogy for this is actually something I picked up long ago from um the old Ultima computer role playing Thank games, you. which were originally designed by Lord British, uh, Richard Garriott, and also um, War Inspector came on for the later games. And something both Richard Garriott and War Inspector have talked about in all of their game design, whether that's the Ultima games or the Deus Ex games um, or any of those games, is that their job as designers is to include for, for a video game, is to include one way for you to do something. So for example, the example they use is if you have a locked door in your, in your video game, then it's their job job to include a key for opening that door mm -hmm. someplace that you can get the key. But if the PCs drag a cannon up to the door and shoot a cannonball through the door, that should be fine. Like they don't, they don't necessarily plan for that, but they do design the games with actual physics engines. And if you do that, they're not going to stop you from blowing the door off its hinges and getting into the room that way. Or maybe you have a teleport spell, or maybe you climb in through the, like you're talking about a tabletop game, maybe you have a teleport spell, or you climb in through the window, or you seduce the maid who cleans the room and she can let you in. So there's this sort of infinite variety of ways that the players can creatively get through that door. Your job is just to have that base one. So for example, I don't think it's cheating to say, hey, this town's under attack. Uh, I'm going to go talk to the town master. Okay, well, what would the town master know? Well, maybe the town master had somebody come and say, hey, there's a bunch of drunken goblins in the Sleeping Giant, for example. That's a logical thing for the town master to know. That's a, that's a logical path of information, which is also why the players went there. Is they thought logically the town master would know more about what's going on. And so it's perfectly logical and, and in fact, very appropriate to do that permissive clue finding and let them find that information in different ways than necessarily you plan. You don't want to get into what I call sort of the old Sierra adventure game mindset. I'm really dating myself with my video game references here. No, no, you're speaking my language. You're speaking my language. But like the old adventure games were like, this is the one and only way that you can solve this problem. And if you don't do it the way that I planned it, you're not going to be able to do it. And you really don't want to get into that. You don't want to suddenly be like, oh, I didn't anticipate they'd blow the door off its hinges with a cannon. So I guess this door must be cannon proof. And you're like, no, just, just let them blow the door off the hinges, right? So 100% with you on that one. Um, so I'm a very permissive DM in general where I, I get sad when the players lose and I'm totally barracking for them to win. And so all the clues I had, I want them to find it. You know, I'm like, I want, I, like, if I could, I'd just tell them at the start of the session, Hey, here's the revelations. You guys win. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but 
Instead, I have to be a little bit tricky and break that information into clues. And some of the clues um, you had the advice to when you're devising what clues to include, um, maybe look at the skill list, you know, and go, is there a clue that I can tie to this skill? Because unfortunately, D&D has a skill called investigate. And they, <laughs> they want to use that every day. So I, I looked at the skill list and had one with like the cat. Right, the cat is old and asthmatic, and uh, there's no way he would be able to get to the very top of the steeple of this building. But some psionic goblin has put him there. Right, that's that was my clue. There's no way he should be able to get up there. It's animal handling. But the players rolled too low to actually access that clue. It's like I want them to find the clue, but I've gated it behind a, a DC. Do you know what I mean? So, so the, the okay, so there's two things at play here, and one sort of a general principle, which is that. When you, when you get ready to roll the dice, whether this is for finding a clue or literally anything else that you ever call for a dice roll as a GM, what you want to do is make sure that you are okay with all the possible outcomes of that dice roll. And if you aren't okay with every possible outcome of that dice roll, you don't want to roll the dice. So if, if in this case, for example, you legitimately said, hey, um, I'm not going to be okay with them not finding, not realizing what's up with this cat, then you never should have rolled the dice roll to begin yeah. with, right? Um, and there's a couple of ways you can respond to that. One is figuring out, well, how can I be okay with it? And the other is like, okay, well, how can I reframe the stakes of this die roll to um, so that both success and mechanical failure are okay with me? One technique for that that I talk about in the book and is well known on the internet as well, of course, is failing forward, mm -hmm. where mechanical failure on the die still means you accomplish the goal, which in this case would be knowing that the cat shouldn't be up there, but there's some sort of consequence uh, for that failure or a complication of some kind. Mm -hmm. The other thing kind of comes back to the three clue rule, where if you have this revelation list, this conclusion you need to reach, which is that there are these psionic goblins, for example, and you have multiple clues pointing to that, the fact that you fail one of your checks or fail to get one of the clues, either because they just don't care about the cat, so they don't think about it, they don't make the check, um, or they don't go by that chapel, so they don't see the steeple, so they don't see the cat, those failure cases, whatever they may be, are covered for by the robust design principle of the three clue rule. And so once you get used to running with the three clue rule, you will begin de-stressing about these missed clues because the missed clue doesn't mean that things have failed, which gets to kind of another, which is sort of the other general principle, though, is if you get into a position where something has to succeed in order for the scenario to work, then that is a excellent specific case example of a situation where you really probably aren't okay with um, with both outcomes of the dice. Um, and, and, you know, it works in the reverse, too. Like, if you're not okay with success, you shouldn't be rolling the dice either, right? Like, whatever that situation might be. It's got to be all outcomes have to be acceptable. Yeah, what a great way to think of it. I, I read the advice from, um, I started playing D&D maybe six years ago, and one of the first things I read was something by Sly Flourish, and the, oh, it might have even been you, but the advice was um, don't hide your levers. Like, this is the lever they have to pull to make the story go forward. Well, don't hide it. You know, then they're not going to pull it. That's Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's another great principle about mysteries, too, is um, the, the way to think about it is like we oftentimes fall into the trap of thinking of mysteries as um, the process of hiding information from the players, because that's what we think. Like, oh, you don't know what the solution of the mystery is. But if you think about how a mystery story, whether in a novel or a film or at your table, actually works on a structural level, the structural nature of a mystery is the acquisition of information. And so, and so, you know, that's the place where you can, that's that's where you want to root for the players. It's not even necessarily individual clues. It's do, are you able to figure out what these things are? Um, and that those are the levers, right? You want to make sure that, that you aren't, that you aren't hiding the levers. It's okay if they don't spot all the levers, as long as they have the levers that they actually, they actually need. Yeah. Do you know what? Three clues doesn't even seem like enough. I like, I would be so content if I had six clues you can never have too many clues i do the reason i have the three clue rules i find that three it seems to be just robust enough that that it very rarely uh fails like if you design a scenario with those three clues they the scenario very rarely runs into a problem not every time some play time sometimes she's not on the same wavelength as your players they aren't thinking the way that you think the biggest problem i run into is not even once i'm using the three clue rule isn't even necessarily 
uh, miss die rolls, it is when the players don't look for the clues in the first place because we aren't on the same wavelength about how the investigation should proceed. I had them, they walked up to a collapsed building and somebody was like yelling underneath going, help me, help me, I'm trapped. And they freed the person and then they left. And I'm like, guys, do you want to like check out what, what's going on with this building or not? Buildings don't do this, fellas. Yep. Like, I mean, like, yeah, something you think should be obvious curiosity, which is another principle, too, I talk about in terms of when you're looking at these three clues. When you're looking at a particular revelation, you can sometimes fall into the trap of having all of the clues be of the same type. So I've been working on a remix of Storm King's Thunder, for example, and a lot of the revelations in the published book are based on you need to talk to a giant. Um, and like there may be a lot of different giants that you can talk to, but that's the only way to get this piece of information. And that technically satisfies the three clue rule in the sense that, like, oh, you could talk to giant A or giant B or giant C, and that's great. But it's limited because they all have a single point of failure, which is that if the players never think, let's talk to a giant, for example, maybe one of them has sworn a blood oath to kill all giants, or they just don't think to question prisoners for whatever reason, then they will never get that clue. So it's the other thing you kind of check to make sure that like, do all these clues fail in the same way? Well, then I need to diversify. And it's, it's okay to like have like, if you have four different revelations, you can have talk to a giant in two or three or even all four of those revelations. It just shouldn't be for the same revelation. You want to have some diversity there so that they don't all fail in the same way. <clears throat> I have two more questions. First is, uh, I'm expecting it's not going to be a dichotomy here. It's going to be like a, a mix of both. But where is the juice in a mystery? Is it juice in like the actual mystery of like what is going on here? Or is the juice in the, the revelation? Yeah, that's a great question. It's going to depend a little bit on your group. Like what, what are they focused on? Which also depends a little bit on the adventure. Like... Let me let me take a analogy to a dungeon again, which is that one of the great things about a dungeon is is the structure of a dungeon is that you have a room, you're in a room, you can investigate and interact with the things in that room. And when you're done interacting with that room, you can pick an exit and it will take you to another room where you can interact with things again. And the great thing about a dungeon is each one of those rooms is a container that you can pour interesting stuff into. And you can pour almost anything into a dungeon room and have a fun little mini experience before moving on to the next mini experience, that's the basic dungeon experience. A mystery can work in much the same way, where the structure of the mystery, these leads that point to other locations or events or people that then have leads that point to other, that is the structure, much like the hallways of a dungeon, that move you from one container that you can pour content into. And so you can have very simplistic mysteries that the actual mystery maybe isn't that exciting for the players, um, but it still structurally serves the function of moving them from interesting, interesting scene, interesting person, interesting location, and so forth. Um, but it's probably better when the players are really curious about what is the solution to this mystery. Like they want it, they have yeah. that driving need to understand this because then you get both. You get both the interesting things along the journey and they are also heavily motivated to continue that journey and to follow, to follow those metaphorical hallways between the different containers of content. So that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of, the juice comes in both forms. There's the juice and the payoff. I'm so excited to get your book in my hands, mate. I think um, I'm hard to shop for for Christmas because I usually just buy the stuff that I want. But if somebody surprised me with uh, like a, a book like this that isn't an official D&D &D book um, but is just like robust and helpful, I would be really happy. So uh, even though this isn't a sponsored video, I, I endorse, I cast in power word endorse. Thank you so much. I was going to say, is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? <laughs> Oh, I should say thank you so much for the kind words on So You Want to Be a Game Master. Like, as we record this, it's been out for just over a week now, and it's been going really well. And uh, and if you do want it for Christmas, uh, then you should probably place your orders now. We actually, it's, it's actually the first printing is selling out, and they've already ordered a second printing. Uh, the publisher has. So... Um, Get it now before you have to wait a while is the is the short version on that one. The other thing I am telling people about Christmas presents, since Christmas is a coming, is that if you are a forever GM and you are always GMing and you want to be a player, you need to buy a copy for all of your players at your table <laughs> uh, because at least one of them, possibly all of them, will be running a game for you within a week. So What a brutal pitch. 
<laughs> Justin, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I'm excited to see what you work on next. You're probably going to have a huge break after this massive media tour uh, and and the whole rigorous um, publishing process. But whatever your next project is on your YouTube channel, on Twitch, on your blog, in physical media, whatever it is, I'm very excited for it. Good luck. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing both your thoughts on this book once you have that physical book in your hand and also uh, your thoughts on my next project. So we'll, we'll keep in touch. What's up? I can only get this audio to come out of the left speaker for some reason. Hey, check out this video where I talk to Justin Alexander about this adventure, the Shattered Obelisk specifically.